Hello and welcome to the 3D printed face mask design challenge part 3. I would have liked to make this video four months ago, but unfortunately I didn't have the equipment or knowledge. Until now. This version includes a replaceable pro-grade filter and an injection molded skin safe silicone seal that you can make at home. This will be a bit more of an advanced tutorial than my previous two videos. Although it may be possible to make one of these on an FDM printer, you will likely have much more success on a resin printer. It is very important to have nice smooth surfaces in order for the mold to function correctly. I have several projects in the works and I need to make prototypes with no failures and minimal guesswork. So I picked up a Formlabs Form 3. What I would really like to know from you all is what other machines are capable of producing this mask. If you have an entry-level resin printer and you are able to make one of these successfully, please post in the comments about your experience. As always, all the parts for this design are available to download for free. Just take a look in the description. There are two things that drove this design. The first was the filter. The major downside to 3D printed breathing devices and many other assorted masks available at the moment is this. What is the filter made from and is it effective? All of my commercial respirators are 3M brand. At the end of the day, I trust them far more than the average Amazon seller. So I decided to use their N95 particulate filter inside of the new design. This is the part where I mentioned that this is not lab tested. The 3M filter is NIOSH approved, but it is not NIOSH approved for use in this device. 3M in no way endorses this product. If you would like to make one and wear it, you will be doing so at your own risk. Now, let's have a quick look at how this thing works. In order to reduce the size of the air cavity between the mask and the face, the filter gets curved. This helps improve respiration. The curve also gives the filter a bit of stiffness. The frame is designed to grab the filter securely, but also snap open and closed with relative ease. For this concept, I wanted to produce a silicone seal that was close to production grade. In order to do this, I had to learn everything I could about DIY silicone injection molding. Using the process from my first mask video, I based the design on the contours of my face. Unlike my second design, the full side walls of the mask are now made from rubber. This is very important because it allows me to move my face as much as possible without obstructing movement or breaking the seal. First step was printing the mold. It has three parts, two outer halves and one centerpiece fit for Cinderella herself. I removed the support structure before curing this part. Leaving the support structure on can help reduce warping during the cure, but the shoe is a pretty rigid structure on its own. The two outer halves were a different story. Because of their shape, they are much more likely to warp, so they were cured with the supports on. Removing these, I think, is one of the worst aspects of resin printers. It's convenient to rip off large chunks of material all at once, but that can damage the part. That's one reason why I always try to keep support structure off of any operational surface. All the parts fit together nicely, but there was some warping to contend with. Formlabs Clear Resin is not the most deformation resistant part in their library, but it is really nice to have a see-through mold for demonstrating this process. I used mold release on my first attempt. Overspray had to be cleaned off of the outside of the mold after it was applied. Then using a dry brush, the release agent was spread evenly over the surface, getting it down into all of the cracks and crevices. Later in the video, I will cover why I don't recommend using this. For the injection, I used a large syringe. The particular one I used had a small amount of liquid in it out of the package. Using some isopropyl alcohol, I cleaned it to prevent contamination of the silicone. Using hot glue, all the parts were attached to one another. It's very important to blob it into every seam in order to fill the small gaps in between the parts. Otherwise, the silicone will leak out of every hole it finds. I designed the mold to use as little resin as possible. If you watch videos produced by manufacturers, they always tend to use the absolute maximum amount of resin or silicone for any given project. There are reasons for this, but to keep the price of the mold down, I figured this was the best approach. 
The injector was duct taped onto the mold. I was sure to apply it as tightly as possible without any creases. There will be a lot of fluid pressure on this component. The silicone was cast with two different types of material for this demo. Sorta Clear 18 that you see here and Ecoflex 0030. Both are certified skin safe. All the individual components need to be mixed thoroughly before combining them. The Ecoflex mixed up more easily because it is a one-to-one -one mixture. The Sorta Clear is a 10 to one mixture, so a gram scale or graduated measuring cup is required. 75 grams of material is just about perfect for a single mask. Be sure to zero out the scale prior to adding the silicone. With part A in the cup, I take the weight of the material and multiply it by 1.1. I'm looking for a total of 73.83 grams in this case. If you have a syringe or dropper for this, it will help keep all of it inside of the cup. I ended up a tenth of a gram too little on part B, but it cured just fine. Mix the two parts together, making sure to scrape the sides, bottom, and stir stick to make sure there is no unmixed material. Once this is done, the mix is transferred to a larger container for degassing. Do not scrape the sides of the smaller container to prevent unmixed material from entering the larger cup. Using a vacuum chamber to remove the bubbles from the material is a critical step in this process. The manufacturer recommends doing this for two to three minutes. I'd like to let it run for closer to five or more minutes on highly viscous material like the Sorta Clear. It has a pot life of one hour, so I have time to let it run until it's almost bubble free. This works great for small amounts of material, but for larger mixes, be careful not to let the silicone overheat and start to cure while it's still under vacuum. When the process is complete, it is important to let air back into the chamber slowly. This prevents silicone from being blown out of the cup or knocking the cup over entirely. You can see here just how viscous the Sorta Clear 18 is. While pouring it into the syringe, I created more bubbles. This was not going to work, so it went back into the vacuum chamber for another minute or so. That cleared things up nicely. This clip is sped up 10x. In real time, this took seven minutes and a lot of continuous pressure to force the material into the mold. The Ecoflex 0030 was a completely different story. This is what the injection looks like in real time. It practically fills itself. By letting the silicone spill out the other side, any trapped air can be ejected. Take note of the tiny bubbles streaming out of the left side of the pour. Once that ran clear, I stuck the whole thing into a pressure pot until it finished curing. One of these is widely recommended for this type of casting, but I found that it, at least in this scenario, seems to cause more problems than it solves. There were no visible bubbles in the part when it went into the pressure pot. I think that they squeezed out of the gaps in between the mold components under pressure. This wouldn't be an issue if the bubbles just stayed where they were. For this reason, I don't think a pressure pot is necessary for this process. A vacuum chamber, on the other hand, is definitely required. It's easy to see the difference with and without degassing. The hot glue comes off easily from this material. It may be that there is a tiny amount of mold release on the part to aid in its removal. Applying rubbing alcohol can help if it's really stuck on there. Using a wood chisel or a similar tool, the two halves are pried open and removed. As I mentioned earlier, one test had mold release and one did not. There was no noticeable difference between the two as far as removal goes. The silicone that seeps in between the parts does not seem to cure properly. My guess is that the product just does not cure in extremely thin sections. This really wasn't an issue because the usable parts cured just fine. As for the mold that was sprayed with release agent, the whole thing was a sticky mess, including the cast part. 
Depending on what material you print your mold with, you may need some kind of release agent on there, but in this case, I prefer to not use it at all. Both the EcoFlex 0030 and the SortaClear 18 formed great looking parts with minimal flashing. The EcoFlex was disgustingly sticky thanks to the mold release and needed thorough cleaning. Any flashing on the parts was easily torn away or trimmed off with a scissors. To bring the parts to a fully cured state, they got stuck in the new shop oven. I got this on clearance last week probably because it makes irritatingly loud noises every time you turn the dial. On bake mode, this one only goes up to 95 minutes. That's a problem for a two hour long cure. The real reason I got this was for its dehydrate feature. Many toaster ovens don't have a low enough temperature or a high enough cook time for my needs. This one cooks for up to 72 hours at as low as 120 degrees. This is not only great for curing molds, but also drying 3D printing filament. You can really see where my priorities are considering this piece of junk is where I cook my food. Now onto the filter frame. These parts were cured with supports on. It seems that if the support structure is narrow, it's pretty easy to remove. That said, you should wear some gloves and safety glasses while doing this process. Some light sanding with 320 and 800 grit sandpaper takes care of the surface imperfections. An X-Acto blade clears the holes for the straps. Here are the finished parts and here is how they should work. Some wax on the parts will help them work even better. However, I would not apply the wax until the silicone seal has been glued on. The inner tabs are used for separating the two parts. To join the plastic and rubber components, I used Smooth-On Silpoxy. It would be ideal to have some kind of applicator for this, but a sharp object seems to work fine for spreading the glue into the joint. The glue works great with the silicone, but the hold is just okay on the plastic side. If I try to pull them apart, they are easy to separate. Overmolding would be much better, but that was just not in the scope of this project. The curing helped with the stickiness of the EcoFlex, but it was still super soft and floppy and didn't glue on as easily as the Sorta Clear, but it did work. For the strap, I use the same quarter inch elastic band that I used on my first design. It loops through the three holes like so. The straps lock into place fairly well as long as the headband isn't stretched to the extreme. To adjust it, simply pull the band perpendicular to the frame surface until the desired length is achieved. For assembly, place the filter into the front part of the frame, then insert the back of the mask. Press firmly around all sides to complete the process. The snap feature makes much less of a snapping sound with the filter installed. To replace the filter, simply press all four tabs at the same time. As far as fit goes, both versions are pretty good. I think that an ideal rubber would be somewhere in between the somewhat too soft EcoFlex and the slightly too hard Sorta Clear. If I had to pick a favorite, it would be the Sorta Clear 18. The EcoFlex is just a little too flimsy. Regardless, I think that both are comfortable for long hours of wear, and at least on my face, the seal is as good as a mass-produced product. 
I took it on a ride, and my 8 mile time was about 20% slower than without a mask at all. I could definitely feel the resistance of the N95 filter at full speed. The seal and overall comfort was great though. The biggest issue I have with this mask is the connection between the silicone and the plastic. If you all have any suggestions for what glue or method might work better than the Silpoxy used in this video, please let me know in the comments. To wrap up this video, I wanted to mention that other than this interesting design, I've only ever molded one thing in my whole life. It was this ornament right here, and I made this last year. So this might appear like a complex process, but it was a lot more simple than I had imagined. Many thanks to all of you for watching, liking, and subscribing. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, do let me know in the comments. I try to respond to everyone. 2020 has been a difficult year for many of us. So from me to you and yours, stay safe out there. This, this picture of me will be on the internet now. <laughs> oh well.